Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to the launch of Mave in America. Yay! <laughs> Thank you, John. That's okay. Me and Maeve, um, for, for three or four years, did a, mm -hmm. did a show together in Brooklyn at the Union Hall, but I had to distance myself from her because she became tyrannical. Um, <laughs> she, can you hear John's soft, lilting Welsh voice? Yeah. Um, you can? Okay. Um, and the way that Maeve became tyrannical was, was she wouldn't ever let me tell the same joke or anecdote twice. And in fact, would, would shame me on stage <laughs> if I said something that she'd heard me say before. But what that shows is that Maeve is a, is a c comedy purist who it. never does the same material twice. Um, and mm -hmm. and and just just produces more and more stuff, and I and I think Made in America is 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 the best thing she's ever written. I think it's just wonderful. Thank you, uh, Maeve, Will you start by reading yeah. something? Um, we've we, okay. Will you read that that thing about money? This is a really kind of odd. You're yeah. about to hear an odd fact about Maeve, an odd true fact. It's page uh, sixteen. Page sixteen. Okay. Uh, so it's about my, um, oh, my money, okay. <laughs> this is funny because I, I just came from a Chase bank. Anyway, <laughs> uh, ask me after what, what's going on at me and Chase. Okay. Um, as I totted up my expenses in preparation for the ball, I realized I should probably be fundraising for my own renovation because my funds were the lowest they'd been since I worked in a skateboard shop. Is this the right part? I, I'm not sure. Hang on. <laughs> yes. It's the, it's, the, it's the next line. Oh. <laughs> is where I wanted you to start. Oh, oh, oh. I'm bad with money. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm bad with money, but money is worse with me. Some days it pours in on top of me, and I have to fling it away to be able to breathe. Other days I look for it everywhere, and there's none to be found. I'm embarrassed about my relationship with money and I often read violent articles online with headlines like, take control of your dollars now, you dumb bitch. <laughs> but I can never seem to do what they tell me. My actual fortune keeps changing. As an adult, I've been so rich, I bought a car for cash and I never used the car. And I've been so broke that I've bought my coins to a check cashing place on Church Avenue and tried to convince the woman working there to give me a full dollar instead of 88 cents. Money feels like a tide that comes in and out, controlled by a moon I can't reach. One time I said that to a bank advisor in a Chase branch in East Harlem, and he looked at me like I was crazy, but then he cancelled the fee I'd incurred for being overdrawn, so I think we all know who won that round. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true about you, Maeve, you really do. If you ever, on the rare occasions, you ever have, like, extra money more than you need, you, you get rid of it really quickly. Right. I mean, and, I, and do you know that that's kind of unusual? Um, <laughs> like you'll just give it away. It's like you've got like a phobia yeah. about having more money than you need. Yeah, I don't think it's a phobia, but it is definitely something I need to work on. And yeah. I think, um, and I didn't fully realize that until I wrote it down. And when I think that's a good, good thing about writing, that it really crystallizes, like you start to understand yourself a little bit more. And hopefully it's entertaining too but also it does help me get to know myself more. And I, I, didn't, I didn't understand that until I wrote it down. And I think you read it and, and said it to me too. Yeah. But I do, I do have a poor relationship with money and I don't feel comfortable having a lot of money. And, but I also, I'm not being like, it's noble to be poor because it's horrible to be broke, especially in the city. Um, so it's a tough balance, but I'm not into consumerism and I'm an anti-capitalist. But yeah. it's funny because I'm here selling books. <laughs> yeah. So what happened in the Chase Bank just now? Oh, well, you see, I'm divesting my money from Chase, but I also owe them four grand. <laughs> so I, it's like really hard to be on my high horse because I owe them money. Mm -hmm. But basically, I phoned Chase because I'm, you know, more and more interested in environmental uh, causes. And Chase are the worst uh, offender. They lend the most money to... Uh, tar sands and fossil fuel industry and all this stuff, right? So I call them and I said, well, you know, what's going on? Like, I heard that you're like the worst one. And uh, 
they passed me around and passed me around. First, I got a, a, onto a call center in the Philippines. And then I was like, I'm not going to like lecture some poor woman in the Philippines about like how she needs to like watch it or she's going to affect, you know. Um, and so then I went into the branch today and I talked to this lady and she was like, look, the most I can do is cancel your $34 overdraft fee. And I said, fine. <laughs> But, you know, when I get paid, I'm about to move all my money out of the bank. And she said, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that just happened. The chase on 5th and 16th or whatever. She's a very nice woman. Just now? Yeah. Okay. I've written, I've written a couple of random things from reading this book that I didn't know about you. Okay. Um, you By the way, thank you for getting dressed up for this. Yeah. <laughs> I, feel, I, feel, I feel very ashamed. I didn't think it through. I was out earlier and didn't think <laughs> I'm that only I was... being cruel. No, I've been feeling really bad about it. No, you look I, good. I, I'm very aware of the fact that I am me, making... You got your legs out for I the am lady. making <laughs> humans see my legs. Um, I feel I've been really fixating on it. No, you look great, John. Okay, I'm thank sorry. You. Um, Try not to get too turned on, everybody. <laughs> So, okay, here's some random things I learned about you that I didn't know. You once went out with a boy who loved his cat so much that he <laughs> helps her masturbate. Uh, is that true? <laughs> that is true. Yeah. I didn't go out with him, but I went out with him a few times, but I, he wasn't my boyfriend. But he did, he had this really irritating cat, and the cat used to get so frust sexually frustrated and you would yowl around his terrible apartment. And he said, you know, sometimes I just have to rock her hips back and forth. And I said, is that all you do? And it, and it wasn't. <laughs> wow. Apparently it's more common than you think. Um, star, um, our, our, friend star, our friend Starly Kine is in the audience and Starly, is I hope it? she won't mind. Yes. Telling the story, Starley once went to a radical honesty session where you have to sit around in a circle and mm -hmm. tell a secret about yourself that you've never told anyone. And I remember all the secrets that Starley told me. The first secret <laughs> was um, the man said that he hadn't paid taxes in 10 years. And everyone was like, oh, it's not so good. And then that is bad, that's yeah. terrible. And then the second secret, the man said, my secret is that I killed a man. I was in a truck and I kicked the man out of the truck and he got run over by a car and uh, he was dead and I murdered him and I got away with it. And then the third person said, whoa, my secret's really um, boring compared to that secret. She said, well, I suppose I can tell you that my secret is that I have sex with my cat. <laughs> Starley, true? <laughs> But then apparently the murderer put up his hand and said, can I uh, add something to my secret? He said, I also have sex with my cat, which is, he didn't want to be upstaged by the cat sex woman, which is how I know that, that that's more common. That's um, more common. Maeve is yeah. a... He, he, didn't have full, he didn't have full sex with the cat, but he just... Okay. Yeah. Maeve is an unusual name in America, but you share it with a uh, clothing line. Yeah, this is what I found out about mine. Is there any other Maeves here? Yeah? Are you Irish? L you're American-born. Look how cute she is. Every Maeve has this lovely, friendly face and these dark eyes. Yeah. Is there any other Maeves here? It's your middle and look at your lovely eyes. <laughs> um, the, kid, the girl up in the, the first place I moved into, in uh, that place in Church Avenue, the little girl in the apartment above me was also called Maeve. So that's, I would hear her name, she's really naughty, and I'd hear her name being screamed, um, Maeve, don't do that to your sister. Like, you know, Maeve, finish your dinner or whatever. All, I was trying to, trying to write in my apartment this disembodied kind of mother's voice screaming at me. There's that Maeve, and then there's uh, a line of clothing and anthropology, which is like my dream, you know, my aspirational life would be to, to just work there, actually. <laughs> <laughs> can, you, can you read the paragraph about how you share a... You um, want me to read it? Okay. Yeah. You want from there? Uh, maybe. What about? Can it? Will it work if you do it from there? With, with the amount? Yeah. Okay. 
Um, with the amount of market research and chilling data that a gigantic company no doubt compiled before naming their quirkiest clothes Maeve. Ooh. Ooh, we all have to stay here for the night. <laughs> um, I have come to accept that my name is synonymous with cookie or kooky. Do I act accordingly? Why don't you tell me? Right after I place a raspberry on each fingertip and giggle down from my unicycle into a Super 8 camera that's permanently trained on me. Not true, but to be fair, I am a comedy writer and I do love listening to radio documentaries while I walk through the snowy woods in my duffel coat and mittens. So perhaps I was infected with the kooky virus the moment my parents named me. Had I been named Kelly, would I be an accountant with a long bob who does triathlons? If my name was Cindy, would I be a big-hearted waitress with a rescue pit bull and a motorcycle? I just don't know. <laughs> okay, what else did I learn about you that I didn't know? Um, well, there's actually, um, there's one chapter in this book that really kind of um, stopped me in my tracks because I don't know you to be kind of raw you're not you're not usually a kind of raw no person. i prefer to make jokes yeah mm -hmm. um but there's one chapter that i thought really and it sort of speaks to why you wanted to, why you want to write memoirs the, mm -hmm. the funny thing about Maeve is that like she's not like somebody who would want to go on stage and write books and stuff mm -hmm. like you're not like an egotistical person you're but not, i must be well so you grapple with this in a way that's not funny um <laughs> and I, and it came as a sort of little bit of a, of a, sh of a you know, good shock, like a pleasant shock, because yeah. you were really, you were like, you were you're like raw and naked. When I said that to Maeve in a text earlier today, you said you were like sushi. Um, yeah, he said, uh, yeah, you said raw and naked. I said, what am I, sushi? Um, it wasn't a very good joke, but I was just having some feelings. But I would, I'd love you to, to read, uh, the, the only other thing I'd, I'd, I think I'd want you to read, because I'm okay. going to talk, is, is this section at some page. Uh, uh, 100 and Three? 102, I think it starts. Um, oh, about Dustin Hoffman? Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, there's this Dustin Hoffman interview I watch online from time to time. It's a straightforward show business chat where he's discussing his long career and what the various roles he's played have meant to him over the years. When he talks about the film Tootsie, where he plays a frustrated actor who has to play a woman to get a job, he starts to get choked up. Hoffman says that he wanted to be as beautiful a woman as possible, but when he watched his own screen test, he realized he was not beautiful and never would be. It's then, all at once, that the value placed on a woman's appearance strikes him. I wonder if he was better off learning the truth in one wrenching moment, a ripping off of the lip wax, as opposed to the way I learn it, a daily tweezing that makes my eyes water still. Maybe the rush of realization was necessary for him because at that moment he had an epiphany and began to cry on camera. Hoffman felt like the woman he was playing was an interesting woman, and he knew that if he met that woman at a party, he would never have bothered talking to her. He understood then that there were too many interesting women he had never experienced knowing in his life because he had been brainwashed into not seeing them. Sometimes when I watch the interview, I feel, a deep, I feel deeply sorry for him and all the other men who miss out on whole people, snuffling past them in search of an available doll who doesn't really exist. Other times I feel a great wave of pity for myself because I have been that interesting woman at a party and I have felt those eyes see past me. I've experienced those one-sided conversations with a man who has no use for me. I've been there saying clever and funny things, bursting with opinions and ideas that may match or bolster or challenge his own while being completely aware that he cannot hear a word I am saying. I should call it what it is, misogyny, that mad rule stating women are contemptible. That is what stuck in poor old Dustin Hoffman's throat, and it sticks in mine too. The, the, Thank the, the, the wider context of that story mm -hmm. is about how you have this kind of desire that, that surprises you to, um, to be kind of seen. It's a chapter mm -hmm. about wanting to be seen. Yeah. So yeah. where does that come from? Because you actually, I mean, in my experience of knowing you all these years, you, you 
you're not like that, but obviously you are like that, or you wouldn't go on stage and you wouldn't write books. Yeah, and I think that everybody is like that. I think that being seen and being, um, I don't know the exact right word. I think being seen is the best word for it, but I suppose like being respected or just being counted as a person um, aside from all of your assets totted up or whatever, mm-hmm. is uh, hugely important to, to everyone. And I think, you know, sometimes I kind of make jokes to my friends, oh, it's really cool to be invisible, you know, like I was this big fat teenager, so I got to really observe what happened at teenage parties. But then I'm like, I don't want that cool vantage point. Like, I want to be in it, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and so I think that if when you feel that way you just want to always tell people like i'm like this like this is what i think this is what i feel and i think that's what i'm constantly doing with comedy or writing or podcasting and i also feel it very keenly from other people who i think don't feel seen and i want to to try and see them too Mm. i actually i always thought that being bullied at school was and being kind of forced to the edge of the playground was a really good training to be a journalist yeah. because you you should be on the outside looking in and yeah. not trusting the cabals not trusting the elites so actually i always like um i'm kind of grateful in a funny way that i was treated badly at school because i think that's what gave yeah. me the desire to write. Um, no, I, I mean, I think that too. Like, and I think it is really valuable and, you know, um, but the, the thing is, you can also have that and also be, is some people manage both. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the other people who aren't seen is, a, is another, and probably, I think probably the most uh, powerful theme in the book. Uh, there's a few chapters in the book about, um, about immigration. Yeah. Just today, uh, Stephen Miller, uh, yeah, announced. My fiance. <laughs> no, he's not my fiance. Uh, it was announced that he wanted to pass a law which would actually, if it passes, and I'm sure it won't, but if it passes, it would mean that you would be ineligible to right, still live I here. Right, because I have Obamacare. Mm-hmm. And yeah. he's trying to pass. He's trying to pass a law that says that if you have food stamps or Obamacare as a legal immigrant you can still be mm-hmm. kicked out mm-hmm. or not have your uh, visa or green card renewed and now i wouldn't claim to be you know panicked because i understand i'm an extremely privileged immigrant but i'm nowhere close to a green card or a citizenship and i do feel a slight vulnerability but nothing like um many many immigrants in in the country who arrived at the same time that we did and and even since then things have changed so quickly mm. you know well i think one of the most powerful parts of the book is the story you tell about how you were doing a podcast about immigration yeah and the your your editor your your boss was trying to get you to be more funny and then you'd yeah. go off and meet people and you couldn't be funny. Yeah, I mean, it's really interesting. I think that, you know, any of you who are writers or, or make things or any kind of creative person, you should be so careful who you work with, don't you? Like, it has a huge impact on what you make. And often, I think, for that podcast, we got a great budget to do it. It's hard to get a good budget for podcasts, but I didn't know fully what I was getting into. I just thought, great, like, we'll take the money and we'll make our thing. Um, and I think, you know, even earlier, I think when you were saying that my writing was more personal and maybe more raw than I usually would, that's because of my editor. Like, she made me do that. And I'm really glad that she did. And I'm so glad that we got to work together on the book because she pushed me in ways that were really healthy and good for my art. Um, but I would say, yeah, with the podcast, you know, I wanted to make a comedy podcast about immigration and we were working on it since 2015. and. Then obviously when the presidential campaign started and you know Trump came out very hard on an anti-immigrant ticket, so things started to feel more serious quite quickly. Um, and then we started broadcasting it uh, the, day, um, the day after he was elected, actually. So uh, things just changed, you know, like you all remember what it was like here. Things changed very quickly and I think um, we had to change the tone of the podcast, but our producer was very much like, no, like you promised us a funny podcast about immigration. <laughs> and so um, that all kind of came to a head. I remember I was flying out to the West Coast 
to interview some people there and uh, it was the day of Trump's inauguration when he made that speech about American carnage and I was watching that in the airport and um, then I got to, first I went to San Diego and then I went to the Women's March in San Diego and that was very moving and the next day I went to um, to the to Friendship Park. Right, will you describe, because not many people get to go to Friendship Park, so will you describe yeah, what it's like? Yeah, it's funny, like? even, I have two friends that are from San Diego and they had never heard of Friendship Park, which is um, a, a, a very small park on the border of Tijuana and uh, San Diego. And it's where, it's kind of the only meeting point at the moment between Mexico and America. There's, there's two big fences there um, and they've used helicopter landing mats from Vietnam. So it's very hard to see through the fence. You can fit your pinky or if you're a little toddler, you can put your whole finger through. And so there's two hours, two days a week where you can go and see each other on the Mexican-American side. And so I went and did some recording there on a Sunday afternoon. It's very hard to get to. Like when I say park, you have to kind of trek through all this, uh, you know, brushy beach, brushy kind of uh, marshy land, and then you get to the beach, and that it's on the, it's on, bless you, and it's on the beach there. Um, and there's a huge fence that stretches right into the ocean between the two countries. And on the Tijuana side, there's, you know, there's, it's like, it's like a, such a funny, ironic contrast. There's games of beach volleyball, there's taco trucks, there's music, and then on the uh, US side, it's just stretches of empty beach, and there's just border patrol agents buzzing up and down, and then there's a few families who've gotten the bus and walked out and gone to meet the people that they've been separated from. Hmm. Um, so it's the only place, is it the, uh, the only place in, in the United States where I've separated families can see each other? It is, yeah. 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 There's a place in Texas that opens once a year with a little gate, but I don't think they're doing that anymore. And is it just like a slit? Or can they like... No, no, you can't. You, there's just a, fe there's a, a full fence. There's no actual space to touch. You can just speak to each other through the fence. And you can't see each other? You can see the shape of the person through the fence, yeah. yeah. And there was a woman who... There's a very good... The New, New York Times did a 360, you know, they do those videos. So you can actually look at that and you can sort of feel what it's like. And it is, you know, um, the most heartbreaking place in America is what it's been referred to a few times. And it certainly was heartbreaking for me I mean when I was there there was a young DACA recipient so if you have DACA you can travel but most people choose not to it's just a bit risky um, so he was just talking to his mom through the fence and she was all dolled up she had gotten a bus for five hours you could see she had her hair in a bouffant and like pink lipstick on and a plane for two hours before that so it yeah. took her seven hours to get there yeah yeah she had traveled right across Mexico to see him for a couple of hours and just to kind of lean against the fence and chat to him. It's crazy. Like when that place opened in the 70s, Pat Nixon, the president's wife, w w was there to open it. And she said, actually, let's cut the barbed wire. They went across the beach. The Mexicans and the Americans travel back and forth. That's the way it's always been. Migration is very natural, very human. So mm. what's happening now is really not natural, I think. Yeah. And you were there, like, having been told by your editor to make it funny. Well, exactly. And, you know, I was there to get a comedy podcast. Yeah. And I was kind of like, what's your name? And he was like, I'm from the, you know, I'm Eric. I'm from the Border Angels. We found two bodies on the beach. People tried to swim, you know. And I was like, cut the tape, you know. Like, yeah. it's so, it's, you know, I believe that there's definitely room for levity in everything. And I think that there's leaving out the humor is leaving out the humanity in a situation. But... Trying to make a comedy show out of immigration at the moment is not appropriate. Yeah. Well, that's what I love so about anyway, it. So anyway, that's why I, why I didn't get a third season. Yeah. <laughs> you said there was this one guy, a, a guy called Vlad, a Romanian DACA recipient. Yeah. And you promised him that you'd put him in the podcast and you'd tell his story, but then... Oh, well, this is the thing. When you... Because I'm also kind of a people pleaser. And I also want, had this idea in my head that I wanted to tell Vlad and his mother, Liana. There are two Romanian uh, undocumented people, a mother and a son. And Vlad is a recipient of DACA. Now, he didn't take DACA for two years because his mother was so worried about, because when you take DACA, you have to give your information to the government. And so he didn't take it for two years, but then they said, look, it's the only way forward, we'll do it. And now they're regretting doing that. Um, but he's a super high achieving, if, if any of you guys are from the dreaming generation or if you know anyone, I don't like saying, you know, good immigrants or immigrants are better than whatever. 
but genuinely the dr the generation of dreamers have worked so hard and they also have worked on behalf of their family often they're translating for their parents navigating culturally and sort of code switching and anyway vlad is one of those kids incredible 22 year old also it's really funny because he's like a white undocumented immigrant he's like this big tall romanian guy he looks like such a republican youth and uh and you know he's not like he's yeah. in there with his arms around all of his uh black and brown undocumented family so you you interviewed him and then you couldn't put him in the show yes and and like that's the thing immigrants have definitely been burned by the media a lot like you know people kind of excavate their stories and then you know either don't use them or they kind of mess them up or um and i swore blind i wasn't going to do that and you know i had lunch and then i went to the, his exhibition i spent a lot of time with them earned their trust and then i went back to my producer saying oh, i've got this great story and they're this mother and son and it's going to make really compelling radio and it's like no it's not in it's it's cut yeah you know so then going back to them and you know it was it was it was a bad situation i think you said that you you'd let them down just as the country was about to because this yeah. was just before you know, this is before was DACA was rescinded mm. yeah so I was kind of like hey remember you gave me all that time and energy sorry bye yeah. um, and then I think that's the experience of uh, a lot of different immigrant communities you know they're really on their own you, you're kind of rough you're, you're appropriately rough on on Irish immigrants uh, because you say that basically they <laughs> they made it by climbing on top of the, the bodies of people who couldn't make it? Well... Was that too...? I mean, you know, I think... Say one interesting example is Annie Moore, right? Who... Mm. I wrote about Annie Moore first in the New York Times and then I expanded it in this, in this book. Annie Moore left from my hometown of Cove and she was a 17-year-old girl. She travelled on her own with her, two, uh, with her two little brothers and she travelled across was the first immigrant through Ellis Island, which is kind of why she's been recorded. Um, and, you know, she was an undocumented, um, no, no passport, no visa, no qualifications. And no questions asked, you just got no to No questions walk asked. In. They had a health check and, and they were white, so they were let in. And now I'm not, she didn't have an easy life at all, but she certainly was allowed in and she was allowed to be reunited with her parents. And this is 150 years ago. Her parents were here working, just as the case with so many families today, and they, the kids make this dangerous journey, but they were welcomed in with open arms, and these three kids came in and were allowed to make their life in America. But Annie's life was not easy, and you know, when she was, the time she was living in the Lower East Side, like the late 1880s, 1890s, you know, Catholic churches were being burnt down, like nativists were on the rampage then too, just like Sikh temples are being attacked now, mosques are being defaced. And Back then, was it? It was the Chinese who weren't allowed in. They were yeah. The, if if the she Muslims had been at Chinese at that time, the, the Chinese Exclusion Act was in effect. So, so her and her brothers would have been turned away. And like, a, it was not easy for the Irish, certainly not. But I think, you know, there's there's a lot more interesting writing than mine on this. There's the book How the Irish Became White, which kind of documents how the Irish got here and did claw their way up, but in doing so, st stood on the backs of others. Certainly, you mm. know, Mike Pence, um, cutie. <laughs> he, uh, he, Mike Pence, like, loves so much to talk about his grandfather. He's from Chicago. He's, his grandfather came from Mayo and moved to Chicago. Mike Pence, like, tells the story. All, he loves to tell it to, like, Latino business groups, which I think is so offensive. <laughs> and he's always like, well, my grandfather came from Ireland, and he worked as a streetcar driver in 1922, blah, blah, blah. 1922, he fled the war in Ireland, right? There was a war of independence, civil war. He left the war. He came to Chicago. He would not have been allowed in had he been Asian. And then he got a job as a streetcar driver. Had he been a black person, he wouldn't have been allowed in t it, uh, to get a job as a streetcar driver. So I'm like, he already had uh, two advantages mm -hmm. before starting, before we even get go into it. That's what I would say to Mike Pence if I... <laughs> I mean, I know I would never be alone in the room with him, but if he... Um, <laughs> was brave yeah. enough that's what i would say to him so you got in on an uh, a, you're an alien of extraordinary ability yes that's my visa okay yeah and you wrote a really i thought a really strong thing in the new york times about how like why should that matter yes because um i you know all this talk of immigration around the french winning the world cup did you catch that you know lots of people were like oh um 
it's immigration is good. Look at these men who, you know, they played for France and like, aren't we glad we let them in? And I just thought that was so gross. Like this summer has been one of the worst in recent history for drownings crossing the Mediterranean. 1,500 people have already drowned crossing the Mediterranean. France won't let them in. Yet they're kind of saying like, but look, here's our great boys. So I kind of think the, the, you know, good immigrant thing, which I benefit from, because I have this alien of extraordinary ability, I think it's really unhealthy. And I think when you start like breaking people down, I even see a lot of arguments, and I understand the impulse where people say, oh, look, all the fruits, who's going to pick the fruit if we kick the Mexicans out? And they're trying to be helpful <laughs> by saying that. But it's like, no, it, it shouldn't matter if, you know, if you're good at comedy or if you're good at football or at fruit picking. Mm. That shouldn't, ma that's not what your humanity depends on, you know? Yeah. So I think this book is you trying to grapple with like who you are in America as an immigrant at this complicated and troublesome time. And do you think that writing this book has given you some kind of insight into all of that? Do you do you feel like you know you know who you are and why you're here? Um I mean I finished the book almost a year ago. And since then, I've definitely been doing more work, you know, um, more kind of investigating of what it means um, and what my identity is here mm. uh, compared to other people's. And for me, it's, it's fascinating. And I think I'm really lucky to be able to do it. And also the thing that's kind of I'm figuring out is that I really love being here, which is weird, right? Because I'm seeing all the problems that this country has, but I'm also appreciating all the brilliant things about it. I've had so many opportunities here. I've met the best people that I've ever met here. Mm. And I really do love it here. So it's confusing. Yeah. Meeting Maeve, I, my first year in New York was really bad. I was kind <laughs> of depressed and isolating. Aww. And it was uh, the promoter, Marianne Ways, who's here somewhere. There's yeah. Marianne, who put me and Maeve together to do the show together. And meeting Maeve was like such an important part of me being happy oh, in New York. So thank, thank you, John. <laughs> I feel the same. Do you no. like how we don't touch? We just got like I don't like being touched. Um, being luckily, touched. I'm not the one. I usually have to say that if, if, it's, if it's my books that are being signed that night, but luckily I don't have to say that. <laughs> um, okay, well, look, we've been talking for like 40 minutes yeah. or so. so take I some think, questions? Yeah, can we take some questions? Uh, the lady there. Go ahead, yeah. I'm going to come to you with a microphone oh, she's gonna if come you don't with mind. Just hang, hang tight. I'm coming. Um, <laughs> um, but the mic's nearly there. It's literally a second. There it is. Um, I wonder when you present yourself so rawly in a book like that, um, how you deal with the resultant feelings of maybe vulnerability. I'm, I'm like, I don't write and I'm not creative. Um, but I am Welsh. And oh. so... I'm Welsh. I know. <laughs> We're probably related. There's only about 12 people. But sometimes I write a Facebook po post. I come yeah. in after a few drinks and I write a Facebook post, <laughs> which is about my feelings. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then I wake up halfway through the night and think, shit, 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 delete, 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 delete. But you can't do that when it's already a book yeah. in print. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could describe feelings of vulnerability, etc., and how you deal with that once you've made yourself... Raw and available well, on paper. Well, now that you pointed it out. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, you know, I mean, I think, first of all, today's the first day the book is out. So I haven't actually heard much about it yet. <laughs> and second of all, um, my favorite type of writing, I think, is when I read somebody and I think, oh, like, that's what I've been feeling, but I haven't been able to articulate it. I haven't been able to put into words. That means the world to me as a reader. Mm -hmm. So I think if I can do anything like that as a writer, then it's, that's my job done. That's really important, I think. And it is tough, especially when you're like Irish and repressed. And, you know, I think it ta it's taken me a while to open up. Um, and, you know, I hope I haven't done it too much. Yeah. Yeah. Some, someone said to me once that our shameworthiness, uh, I guess, which is the same as our vulnerabilities, uh, our shameworthiness lies in the space between who we are and how we present ourselves to the world. And oh. so if you get to the very core of, of who you are, like in all the kind of the mess that you are, and you write it down honestly, it's actually de-shaming, I think, because there's, there's no space. You're invulnerable. Who yeah. said that to you? Uh, come, Ashley. Like Mahatma Gandhi or something? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, I don't remember. I might have actually thought it myself. Um, but, um, but then I realised that Brene Brown's been writing this shit for years. So yeah, every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, who else is, uh, Thanks for the question. Oh, there's some. Yeah, oh, there you go. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm glad that you're the one who's making the decisions. I always get very. <laughs> if two people put their hands up at once, I get very flustered. Just crying. Yeah, I realised I'd make a terrible Sophie in Sophie's Choice. <laughs> I'd be like, I'll kill both, both my children. Yeah. Okay. Come. So I was wondering, by the time it gets to the page, have you taken daily notes? Have you gone through many revisions? How, how does it? How does your method work? Um, so I started as a stand-up comedian, so often it's little bits that I've tested on stage, especially for the funnier parts. And then I suppose when I was writing about immigration, I was taping everything for the podcast and I was doing kind of more researched work, so I had lots of notes to go on. And then uh, I do tons of procrastinating, which is familiar, I'm sure, to anybody who writes or does anything in their <laughs> life. Um, so a lot of procrastinating and then it often comes out you know, uh, quite quickly, and then uh, on deadline. <laughs> and then I sent it in then to Lindsay, my agent, and Sarah, my editor, were both my first readers. And they were, like, incredibly helpful in uh, honing it and asking questions and pressing and getting rid of the fluff and stuff like that. That was the process for me anyway. Yeah. Hmm. Anyone else? Oh, oh, yeah. there. Hello. Hi. 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 Can't hear in one ear. Um, speaking of having no money yeah. and pursuing the arts, yeah. um, I am a college student who yeah. has a degree in journalism and wants to be a playwright. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in your experience, practical ways for, you know, trying to plan out a career and not mm -hmm. be consumed by despair over debt. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and having faith in yourself. Um, you know, I think having a job, I was a babysitter for the first two years I was here, and I think having a regular job and writing when you can is not only practical, but it's, um, you know, it's actually useful for your work too, because I think it's brilliant that you're qualified in journalism and you have that training, so you're always going to be working in that way, and then you can be, but you're, you know, journalism, you can find stories anywhere. In fact, I just wrote a story for the Progressive about immigrant nannies. Mm. And so I went and interviewed lots of immigrant nannies and d talked about the history of it. And um, so my practical advice would be try and get a job anywhere so that you're not worried about money and get one that's not too intellectually taxing, that's hopefully enjoyable, and then write when you can and get a nice community of artists around you. And, um, and maybe not live in New York. And Truly. also be kind of psychologically fucked up and think that you can only, like, you're, you're only worth something if you constantly yeah. produce work. It's like an itch that's just impossible to scratch. Yeah, yeah. You're, you're looking for what? I've got the psychological fuckery covered, but yeah. I also have older relatives who own in New York City, so, you know, just... <laughs> oh yeah, bide your time. Yeah. yeah. Don't murder though. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Oh, there's one. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Hi, big fan. <laughs> um, I was wondering um, if Vlad and his mother had a chance to read the essay that you wrote about them. Yeah, I sent it to them before because, you know, I feel like I had kind of burned them. They were very nice about it, incidentally. Vlad's mother said you'll find another way to tell this story. Yes. And you did. Yeah, she was, she's the most determined woman. She's a law, she was a lawyer in Romania, actually. And, uh, you know, now she's a cleaning lady in L.A. And so, you know, they read the story. She was like, there's a few inaccuracies. Send me some corrections. <laughs> <laughs> But I know that she really liked it because I also interviewed her friend who then contacted me separately and said that they both sat down and read it and, you know, it meant a lot to them. So that was, yeah, that was... I don't really write a lot about other people, so I was careful about that, yeah. Thanks. Oh. Coming yeah. up to the front, just oh, hang yes. tight. Hi. Hi, How thanks for coming. Of course. Um, to ask you a serious sort of serious question, yeah. you know, because you have this interesting role that you can sort of speak to 
you know, what the Irish experience was in the United States. And, but then how do you respond when people push back? When you say, oh, but we were persecuted yeah. for all these reasons, when people push back and say, yeah, but today's immigrants or today's refugees are yeah. just that much different. Um, so I do get that, actually. What were you going to say? Speaking about, I just remember this this really great, chilling moment in the book, talking about, you know, they're different, about Annie Moore and her children. Oh, how she had 11 children? Is yeah, that what you mean? and then, like, only six of them... Survived. Survived. And you write, in fact, when you answer this question, let me find this, this paragraph that I just thought was so well okay. written. <laughs> you know, there's actually a lot of myths to clear up. Sometimes people say to me, oh, but Irish people were slaves too, and white people were slaves, which I know for a fact isn't true, but you'd be surprised how many Americans think that that's true. They're mixing up indentured servitude, they're mixing up, there's right-wing memes that go around. So often there's like some unpicking that I need to do to even get the truth of it. And I think the truth of it being, yes, we were once oppressed and, um, Comparisons with today are very easy to make, I think. Like, there was uh, 20,000 Irish people who were left on an island off Boston, and they were kind of quarantined there, but like so many of them died. And I think of, you know, the boat that arrived here with the Jewish people who were, it was turned back. And there's very little difference in that to me between these Africans who are crossing the Mediterranean or these Syrians who are literally barred, you know, as you know, Leah, barred from entering the country. And I think that so much is happening now, I wonder if people even understand that the full Muslim ban is pretty much in effect now. And on my podcast, I had, you know, I had one Syrian guest, asylum seeker, Mohammed Zaza, who lives here now. And, you know, chatting with him, his concerns were he's trying to quit smoking. He has a two-year-old now. He doesn't want to put weight on, but he doesn't want to be smoking in front of the baby. Like, this is like, this is like Mohammed's life. Do you know what I mean? And to, it's so easy to relate to. He's like my, he's, he really reminds me of one of my uncles who's also like really addicted to smoking and is a chubby guy. Um, and try, it's, it's, my, it's a great mystery to me why people don't care about something that doesn't affect them and, they, and that it's, they feel so safe. I found it like a, oh, you on did. your last three words, it was like a game of Russian roulette I was playing just that. I felt like Christopher Walken at the end of The Deer Hunter. And I, <laughs> And I, but I found it just in time. The bullet missed my head and it went did. into the ceiling. Yeah, it's this bit here. Um, Do you want me to read it? Annie Moore through to there. Annie Moore never made a fortune or wrote a book or invented a computer. That's because everyone is always like, Steve Jobs' dad is Syrian. They're like obsessed with that. <laughs> and, uh, and why should she? Why should immigrants be deemed extraordinary in order to deserve a place at the table? She did enough. She was just one woman who lived a short life, a hard one. She had 11 children, but only six made it through to adulthood. Can you even imagine burying five of your children? I personally, I can't. I tuck that part away in the whole, she must have been different from me with fewer feelings folder. The delusional one that's full of news stories from faraway places that are too terrible to bear. So I guess I'd do it too, you know? Yeah. Hi. 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 Um, you've talked about being anti-capitalist, about trying to divest your money from <laughs> like the chase because of the yeah. loaning to the environmental degradation and misogyny and what have you. And you're thinking about these things constantly. And in today's world, I imagine it's all consuming as it is for many of us. So mm. what kinds of things do you think about or do you do that kind of give you the energy to keep fighting against those seemingly insurmountable evils? <laughs> um, I mean, I do stuff like this, writing about it, talking about it with friends, um, having a lot of fun. And I think I learned that from, first of all, I'm not in any danger. And I think it's really important for those of us who are not in any danger to remember that. And it's just to be logical. And I understand that America is going through these huge growing pains, but a lot of us are very safe and it's our duty to be working. And so um, there's a really cool guy, Yosemar Reyes, and he's an undocumented Mexican-American poet. And he started this hashtag and a movement called UndocuJoy, where he is insistent on being joyful. And he's like, 
it's just part of life. We're going to have parties. He's going to like be looking for a boyfriend in the clubs. Like that's what he's doing. And I think that's really important. And I think it's really, um, you know, it's really honest too, because it's not true to humanity to be all down and gloomy and, you know, scared. We're very resilient creatures, actually. Mm. And that, and I think I got a dog. <laughs> 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 and I would say we should all get dogs, and there's a free dog for everyone in the audience. <laughs> very big, wild dogs. Yeah. We have time for one more Thank question. You. There is one. All right. Oh, Starly. Starly. A professional questioner. I'm just going to say you should all adopt dogs. Oh, you should. Yeah, Starly is very much. Starly's very tyrannical about not yeah, getting dogs. Yeah, she will dogs cut from you off at the knees if you buy a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Even though she bought a dog. Yeah. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, so are we done? that isn't the last question. So is there, is there, does anyone have is there? Is there anybody else? Yeah. yeah. Hi, congratulations Hi. on your book. I'm so excited to read it, and yeah. I love your podcast. Um, I, I loved how you said um, that keeping the levity in a situation also keeps the humanity in the situation, um, but then you were also talking about how it can be inappropriate to use comedy sometimes. Yeah. So I'd just love to hear your opinion, um, maybe have some closing thoughts on when you think it is appropriate to use comedy or, or when comedy... Um, yeah. Can can illuminate a situation as opposed to another form of you know long form journalism or something like that. And can yeah. I can I add to that question yeah. like or do you still feel like you're kind of figuring that out because we're yeah. the world is going through such changes and I think ev you know everybody who's got a you know rights is having to kind of think about those questions and there's that big Netflix show that everybody loves called The Net which is all about that and yes. uh, yeah and so I don't know maybe maybe you haven't yet. I'm definitely still figuring it out and you know this new podcast that I'm doing which is about environmental justice is definitely like a tricky line to to balance it with I'm doing it with Mary Robinson who's a big climate justice advocate the former Irish president a very serious <laughs> woman and um, and you know it's my job to 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 ask questions and be curious and also to kind of lift it out of you know heaviness if I can um, but I don't want to be glib either. And if people are really working hard, I'm not about to go and, um, you know, like make their work smaller by making jokes about it. So I think it is a tricky balance. But I think if you, I've been doing comedy for 12 years and hopefully I can read a room and read people in a situation enough that I don't put my foot in it too often. But I do think it's worth in whatever field you're in, and I know you're a Latin speaker, so I don't know how you would <laughs> communicate jokingly in Latin. But like, I think whatever field you're in, it's it's worth trying, isn't it? Like, it's worth trying to have some humor and to have some um, sense of lightness. Uh, and I think it ma can make a real a real difference in somebody's day. Well, I think this book um, gets those tonal shifts just perfectly Thanks, right. Thanks, John. Uh, you, 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 I, I, yeah, and. Um, and, and it's such a great book, and it's so sad, and it's so funny, and you've written a really great book. Uh, Thank you, John. And I really appreciate everybody coming tonight. I was pretty sure that it was just going to be the girls from Penguin who did so much work. <laughs> Thank you, guys. And, um, but I really appreciate you coming out on a Tuesday night with a thunderstorm and a broken elevator. Sorry, Katie. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for having me to everyone at The Strand, too. Thanks, everyone.